Hello, and welcome to Rowan Little's Writing Corner. My name is Rowan Little, and this is the audio version of The Dargan Sisters, a short story in story time with Rowan Little. Narration is provided by myself. The story description is provided below, as well as a link to where you can purchase the story for only two fifty. This is a high fantasy romance, but it does not feature any adult scenes. Listener discretion is advised for themes of blood and warfare. Please enjoy. Maria Braun of Dargo was rumored to be the most beautiful young woman in her small village, quite possibly in all of Atmana. Judging by the way the men and some women fussed over her, she was the most beautiful in all of Anilil. Though most would, ag would argue her freckled cheeks were her sole unattractive features, others became too lost in her brindle eyes to recognize the blemishes. While legends have been passed down for generations about the fickleness and short tempers of redheads, there were several of Darga who would give a month's salary simply to touch her wavy ginger locks. Maria Braun had been pursued since she'd come of age, and the only weapon she possessed was her sharp tongue. That alone was enough to make suitors of Darga take a few steps back and reassess their decisions. However, to be presented with the challenge of winning her over was enough to keep them coming back for more. If another man in this village declares his undying love for Maria, I am going to hang myself from the raptor rafters by this bowstring, Lysada informed her father one morning. While on her way into the shop, she witnessed a trail of men, some young and some old, stalking her twin to their mother's produce stand. As soon as she'd entered her father's shop, she'd set to work on an oak b hunting bow that a local had requested for his trips. Many forgot that Maria Braun was one of two daughters, however. In fact, she had an identical twin sister with exact features. The differences between them were temperament and desire for attention. Lysada wanted none of the attention Maria Braun received. For, from the time in which she could think for herself, she believed that Maria Braun's allure would only bring her trouble. So Lysada, be because her mother absolutely forbade her to cut it, tucked her hair into a bun as tight as she could get it, and covered her head with a scarf provided by her more lenient father. She kept to her family's shop and away from the public eye. Drudwin chuckled at his daughter's exclamation, never letting up on his own project. If you showed off as much as your sister, you would attract the same attention. From the time they were born, their parents determined that the girls were the only children they would have. Blacksmith Drudwin and his wife Rigna had wanted at least one son, but the danger of birthing twins had been enough of an experience for both of them. Drudwin was happy that he'd gotten to keep his wife and both infants after that gruesome labor. Lysada scoffed, instinctively reaching up to make sure every piece of her orange hair was tucked out of sight. She even patted her clothes harshly to make sure they were baggy enough to let loose a thunk every time she did so. Her goal was to appear as unattractive as Maria made herself attractive. So far it had worked for her. Not one man had approached her other than to request an order for her father's work. Little did the men of Dargan know that at least a third of the smithing projects went to her. As Drudwin's girls had grown older, he saw in them the differences that would eventually decide which one would be the heir to his business. When Maria Braun was busy learning how to be ladylike from his hard-working wife, Lysada was hiding near the grindstone, watching her father smelt and forge. His daughter had been thrilled the first day he'd handed her a knife and told her it needed sharpening. Rigna hadn't forgiven him for the cuts Lysada had received on her first project, but Drudwin couldn't have been prouder if his child had handed him a brand new sharpened sword instead of that single-sided, still fairly dull knife. She had since perfected her weaponry skills, never having tackled an entire piece of armor successfully. How is it possible? How could so many men fall for such a pretentious, short-tempered, loud-mouthed, you really should not speak so ill of your sister? 
you had ever spoken as plainly in public as you do to me, they would feel that same way about you. Her father chided. Lysada shut her mouth then. Their family unit wasn't average. Drudwin's smithing business kept them fed, and Rigna's talent for growing the most flavorful and abundant produce kept them Maria Braun helped her mother tend the garden, and Lysada aided her father in the shop. They were a close family, and in spite of Lysada's many complaints about her sister, they seemed happy. Lysada had settled into testing the bowstring of a recent project when a loud commotion drew her attention. She tried to ignore it, guessing that it was just an early ruckus in the market area. That is, until Maria Braun came in squealing, the potatoes in her basket, in the basket she was carrying, rustling about noisily as she dove into the shop to grab Lysada by the arm. Lissy, let's go! I'm busy, she declared, jerking her arm out of Maria Braun's hand only for her twin to grab her again. There are soldiers here! Come on, I don't want to miss what, what they're decreeing! That explained the ruckus. Darga rarely saw any of the royal cav cavalry, but Lysada was more interested in finishing her commissions. Then you go watch them. I don't want to. Let's see. Maria Braun whined, long and loud, side-eyeing their father as if to prompt him into defending her case. But before Lysada could tell her father no, he was already telling her, you should take a quick break, just to see what, they're, what they are here for. But... Yes! Maria Braun cried out triumphantly. Dropping her basket next to the bow Lysada was working on, she used both hands to pull her sister up and out of the shop. Within moments, Maria Braun was rambling. I never see new people at the stand. It's always the same boring faces and the same silly questions. Lysada kept a hand on her scarfed head as Maria Braun pulled her through the gathering crowds. She was overwhelmed by the number of villagers who had gathered around the troop of riders she could now see above all the familiar heads. Without the shop to hide in, or the safety of her father's level head, she too resorted to blurting things out to her sister. If they're so silly, why entertain them? Maria Braun scoffed. I'll have to settle for someone one day. May as well keep the attraction while I still have it. Also, you can't be rude to customers, you'll lose them. Of course, Lysada remarked unsteadily as Maria Braun pushed her way through. She didn't have to push much, as people tended to shift to allow her through. Lysada was sure the majority of those moving, who Maria Braun thanked profusely, were gawking at her. Lysada, however, they did not leave much room for, and that was what had her focus so uneven. Perhaps you should try a bit of flirting. That might get you some more commissions. I'm afraid it doesn't work that way. People didn't show up at their father's shop to flirt and gawk. They showed up because they'd broken something while hunting. <clears throat> or just show a bit of your head. That'll make them like you. I don't want to be liked. She wanted to work and not get her hair caught in a grinder because she was trying to find a worthy suitor. Honestly, you have no clue. Here they are! Indeed, here they were. Maria Braun had managed to bring them both to the very front, right before the cavalry. The sound of hooves against dirt and hushed voices filled Lysada's head as the village awaited the main messenger to come forward and read to them all. The head of Darga was overlooking the crowd from a makeshift stand, seemingly counting and keeping tally of all present. Lysada inferred he was making sure at least one member of every family in the village was here to listen, and soon he would signal the messenger forward to give notice. This village was small enough they could afford to wait until every necessary person was present. Meanwhile, Maria Broughton was paying attention to some other details. There's a woman heading this group. Lysada looked up, and indeed there was, a large woman at that with a stern face and an utter boredom that Lysada could relate to. After taking that into account, she looked over the armor of, the, of half the troop. Not all of this particular cavalry was exactly of that mana. Some of these are Bogdan soldiers. What does that mean? 
I don't know. Soldiers from another kingdom could mean anything. The head of the village signaled the main messenger up to the stand. The cavalry shifted, and from the center approached an armored, caped man on the back of a flea-bitten gray horse, twice as adored as all the others. Lysada practically heard her sister's jaw drop after the approach of the now most assuredly royal messenger. The prince? she asked, gaping at him. Lysada sighed, still eyeing the soldiers and the one leader Maria Braun had pointed out as she had reached up and used two fingers to push her sister's mouth closed. The messenger dismounted and took his place on the stand. The head of the village stepped back and the blonde man with dark eyes and a square jaw introduced himself as none other, none other than Sir Graham, Prince of Etmana. The announcement? An engagement. His Majesty Kinloch of Atmana is to be married to Her Majesty Merwin of Bogdan as part of a treaty to unite against the common enemy kingdom, Belexus. Maria Braun's eyes were locked on Sir Graham as he continued to list off the grievances the kingdoms shared against Belexus, including the loss of Petra, the dragon tamer, princess of Atma Atmana. All seemed less remorseful over the disappearance of the dragons who had allied with Atmana against Belexus than Lysada believed they should be. Though the battles had taken place in hers and Maria Braun's childhood, they still stung many to think of not because of the not because of the loss of an entire race, but the loss of one girl who had been wise enough to see conscience and concern in that race. Lysada lost interest in the Alliance notice, staring down at her feet instead and thinking of dragons, cavalry, and the possibility of women in armor. These things interested her, not the now stammering Sir Graham announcing the King's betrothal. If she had been looking up, she would have seen that he was stammering because his eyes had transfixed on one singular member of the crowd. I have no interest in Her Majesty. You do have an interest in Belexus, however. The castle's catacombs were the last place one would think to find the king. No one would believe the man who sat on the throne in his place to be a body double, a faithful body double at that. Yet Sir Graham was the only person to possess a key into the catacombs to see the true king. Her Majesty Fael, Fael of... Belexus still yearns for what she calls a rematch. She is no majesty to me. The pale and sickly king took a long, deep breath. He was the opposite of his younger brother, Graham, strong and accustomed to the sun on his skin and in his light hair, which Kinlock stood lean and, though tall, less imposing as he was allergic to the light which made Graham strong. As long as there is a chance she may retaliate, we need as many forces as possible. He told himself this because his marriage to the, to the Merwin would secure forces. Are you certain you are the one who must wed her? Yes. It was his duty as king to produce heirs and to secure allegiances. He had not yet served either purpose. While his kingdom was, wasn't wealthy, his people were not overcome with poverty. That had been his main goal for as long as he had reigned, now to fulfill his other duties. He knew Graham's concerns well, though. I would not ask you to perform more of my duties for me, brother. This was as affectionate as he allowed himself to get with Graham, who went above and beyond the call, of, the call to serve his king and ensured the safety of his body double and the security of his true home. I know, Graham responded. Now for a subject less removed from his situation and closer to his brother. Did you find anything concerning as you spread the news? It was Graham's small grin to himself after alerting Kinlock of minor town-to-town -town issues that drew his attention. What captures your attention so? Listening to how his brother had faltered during his decree would have been less amusing had he not told him why he stumbled. He had had a fabled experience, and it was more fascinating to Kinlock than his duties as a king. 
a royal escort, a congratulatory note from her mother, a warning look from her father. Her sister had captured the gaze of Sir Graham, Prince of Edmana, and was being taken to the castle for the courtship. Lysada burst out of her home the day her sister left, her heart racing and her eyes watering. She couldn't breathe. She couldn't speak. Maria Braun was nervous. She was ecstatic. She was hesitant. She was thrilled. She had taken the invitation without a word and was on her way to a palace where Lysada could never see her again. Her family said that she was overreacting. They said that Maria Braun might return. Her father's declaration that if she returned, he would be disappointed in the royal family for abusing his daughter's feelings hadn't helped. In fact, the comment had made her more desperate not to lose her sister. For all her complaining about Maria Braun's habits, Lysada hadn't wanted to lose her sister. She had expected them to drift apart, after all. They already had. Just not this far apart. Lysada ran to the woods, ignoring the many words of caution her parents had given her about the monsters that lie within. The edge of their kingdom no longer bore dragons, but there were still any number of monsters lurking in the dark, waiting for unsuspecting prey. She didn't think of those monsters. Those monsters weren't taking her sister from her. She didn't make it far into the forest before reaching a small clearing. In the center stood a brilliant tree with roots large enough to trip, and trip they did, as her foot caught on one, and she landed heavy on the ground. She did not move after that. She didn't even move to pull the scarf back over her head after coming loose and draping over this dirt and roots. The tears spilled as she shrank on the ground. Lying still, face red hot and chest tight, she wept as she thought of all the things, of the room she once shared with Maria Braun. She thought of that space where they as young girls would lie and trade secrets, where they would shush as as soon as they heard movement in the next room so their parents wouldn't catch them up. Where they would talk endlessly of how they were going to settle in the village. It was Lysada who wanted to travel, Maria Braun who wanted to settle. Lysada wanted a smith, Maria Braun wanted a family. Lysada told her sister to be picky, and she promised she would. Maria Braun told Lysada to never go into the woods. And here she was. But Maria, Bro Maria Braun had broken her promise, too. A gentle pull on the scarf didn't immediately catch her attention like it should have. That is, until it was pulled completely off her head. Lysada jerked upright, freezing in that position as she looked about for what would have taken her head cover. It was strange having her hair exposed. It felt wrong. Seeing no one at all felt wrong also. She remembered vaguely her father mentioning monsters that hide in the trees and looked up slowly. Her hands were shaking. She'd never seen a living monster, only the bodies of those killed by hunters. She didn't know how she'd react if she could p properly defend herself with the knife she'd kept in her boot. She didn't know what to expect. Nothing. She saw nothing. Nothing but the scarf hanging from the branch just above her head. Standing slowly, she kept her eyes up. Whatever it was in the tree, and it, and it had pulled her scarf from her head. Whatever it was was in the tree, and it had pulled her scarf from her head. Wiping her eyes quickly, she reached out for the scarf tentatively. She would, she would just snag the end and run. That was all she needed to do. Grab it and run. Her fingers brushed the material lightly, and she almost had them hooked around the edge when she saw it. She saw the movement. The creature was camouflaged so thoroughly, it was practically invisible to her, even as it yanked the scarf from her fingertips once again. Even though she had seen the movement, once the creature settled, she saw nothing again. She couldn't find it. She couldn't judge how big it was, what it was who it was. All she knew was that they were teasing her, and her upset that had turned to shock suddenly turned to annoyance. 
Her throat was tight, and her voice trembled more than she would have liked when she declared, I won't play your games, so stop it. She sniffed. Don't need the stupid scarf anyway. She had no sister to contrast anymore. She was thinking perhaps of running now. After all, a beast had just revealed itself to her, and here she was, standing and crying like a fool. She was left frozen once again when something drifted to the ground before her eyes. She looked up first. Still nothing. Then down. Her scarf. Taking the drop for something benevolent, like an apology possibly, Lysada bent down slowly. Crouching on the ground, she picked up the scarf in both hands. Staring at it momentarily, she felt the tears welling up again. Before she knew what she was doing, she collapsed against the tree and sucked in a shaky breath. She held the scarf to her mouth as she continued to cry. Only this time, she had an audience. And that audience reached down and touched her head as if to ask what's wrong. To her family, she could say none of this. They would all start crying too. They would all feel bad too. But to an unseen audience member, my sister. She swallowed hard. It was the only friend I had. The tears streamed, and she felt lonelier than ever. She may never come back again. Her throat was closing. Her sobbing threatened to start again. She held the scarf tighter as a strand of her own hair caught her attention. It hung at the side of her face and was the exact shade of her twins. Who will I talk to now? It didn't occur to her until later, after crying while invisible digits scraped gently over her head. She had already found her new companion. Once she stopped seeing the loss as a loss, she could see the beginning of something new for what it was. She was alone for all of one day before she realized she wasn't alone at all. Sir Graham was a dream. A dream that she couldn't quite believe to be true, just yet. Ever since the invitation to the castle, Maria Braun had been tutored by some of the most upstanding ladies and educators. After all, anyone courting a prince must be able to match intellects. That was the order His Majesty Kinlock had passed down to her tutors, at least. She was even learning from the court sorcerer, who showed her books and rewarded her improvement by demonstrating her magic. Because of the tales, because of tales of Balexian sorcery, Maria Braun used to fear magic, but having it so close by actually made her more comfortable with it. It seemed less strange to now that she could see it with her own eyes. Because of her education, it was actually rare for her to see Sir Graham. She met with him over meals, and the talks they had were just as dreamlike as he was. Much of her time was spent in studies and libraries and her chambers, learning history and proper longhand and what questions were no longer permitted. There were surprisingly few things she felt she was allowed to discuss with Sir Graham. She could always tell when she broached a subject she wasn't supposed to, discuss because his cheeks would flush red. To his credit, he'd be embarrassed long enough for her to apologize. Then he'd answer the question anyway. It seemed at times he was just as tired of the confinements of his home as she had grown to be of hers. She missed Darga, though. She missed it so much sometimes she found tears staining the books she was trying to read, and for a brief moment wondered to whom they belonged, only to find the salt water on her own cheeks. Sir Graham was a dream, but the home she had left behind was still her reality. She thought of Lysada. This was the first time they'd truly been apart. Sending the first letter home was the most difficult one. She tried desperately not to cry on the pages. She didn't want her family to see the spots and think she was unhappy here. She was content. It was new, far removed from anything the village had ever shown her. The fact that she was barred from physical labor she had been accustomed to all her life was so strange, and she wanted to share with them the differences she was faced with. 
As she was writing, she pretended they were there with her. It was easier to imagine the conversation. She had always been able to talk to them, no matter the subject. She wrote of the tutors and the things they talked about that, that were considered inappropriate. She wrote of the history, the legends they taught her. She told them of how some of the tutors remembered Petra the Dragon Tamer, and told of her kindness and strength. She knew Lysada would love to know that the princess was also a woman of armor, strong and imposing at such a young age. Lysada had always had the, had the not-so-secret desire to be an armored maiden. She was more blatant about it when they were small, but had quieted when she took up smithing. Lysada loved their father's trade, so Maria Braun knew she, she'd be hard-pressed to give it up entirely. At the very least, she knew how to wield the weapons, but not wear the armor. Maria Braun couldn't work in the gardens like she so desired. Her hands sometimes itched to unearth and cut free vegetables and fruit again. She could tell her mother of just how much variety the gardens had. Food for the feasts, herbs for the meats, flowers to decorate and scent. There was so much, so much her mother would crave to touch. And here Maria Braun was, so close and yet unable to do anything more than smell the myriad plants. Touching would dirty her hands, and the court couldn't have that. She ended the letter with a note to her. She ended the letter t with a note to her sister. She ended the letter with a note to her father that she would try as soon as possible to view the armory for him and Lysada kissing the letter she sent it. When she received a reply in the following leak, week, that was when she did cry, this time tears of joy. Her parents were fine. They were working normally. Mother had brought in another village girl to help with the gardens. She told her the girl tried hard, but the garden simply didn't respond to her the way it did Maria Braun. Lysada and father were hard at work in the shop often, no doubt distracting themselves from the missing person in their household. It was Lysada's section that reassured her the most, but it also broke her heart to read. Lysada had adjusted m slowly, mentioned the emptiness of their old room now that Maria Braun was away. She told her all of what had been happening in the village, of commissions and rumors passed around town. Maria Braun sniffled, recalling how they would whisper those rumors to one another across their pillows. She could hear Lysada's voice in the words, and she could pull from her memory the exact places where Lysada would tell her these things. Over their pillows. Over dinner. Leaning close and walking in the street. Maria Braun could think of the exact moments Lysada would choose to say these things as well, or reactions she would seek from other surrounding others surrounding them at the time she was sometimes unaware of her own cunning maria braun always spoke deliberately sometimes lysada would just let these words fall out without restraint all while claiming she showed more restraint while side-eyeing fans of maria braun's hair across the road while glaring down an unreliable patron in the shop while goading their parents into a scold. It was the memories of these conversations and how the words in the letter translated into memories that left Maria Braun both missing home and feeling as though her family were truly right there with her. But like everything else she loved, she was unable to touch them again just yet. Her greatest relief in the letter was hearing that Lysada had made a new acquaintance to whom she spoke to regularly. She didn't mention much about the person, and that led Maria Braun to believe that she was hiding the friend from their parents. It made her giggle and cover her mouth through her tears, because it was clear in Lysada's words that she felt affection for this friend she called Spectre. Maria Braun was sure to pester Lysada with the sort of uncomfortable questions about this Spectre she wasn't allowed to ask Sir Graham. The season's turning did not deter Lysada from her trips to the tree in the forest where Spectre resided. She had taken to call him then Spectre, 
as they never fully manifested before her, but they did have shape. It was clear in the way the tree moved, and their transparent image distorted what lay behind them whenever they moved. It was like water gliding across air, the way Spectre moved. It was like nothing was ever there whenever Spectre settled, rippling into in invisible stillness. She read Maria Braun's letters aloud to Spectre. She blushed at some of the questions her sister asked. I think she thinks I'm trying to court you, Spectre. They responded by shifting in their seat within the tree, the empty branches already freed of leaves so the shifting was less obvious. Lysada's face flushed as she read aloud the remainder of the letter. She only realized how deeply colored her cheeks had turned when an invisible appendage brushed against her face. It felt clammy, almost like the skin of a frog. As usual, however, she saw nothing but the transparent movement of Spectre, and never their actual form. I'm just a little chilly, she murmured. The air had grown bitter as autumn approached. Tilting her head back, she looked up into the tree to see the transparent movements of Spectre, those faint shifts she could just barely catch. She always wondered just how large they truly were, or how small. She wondered many things about them. As she continued to read the letters Maria Braun sent her, sitting with Spe Spectre as she wrote a response, she spoke aloud of how happy she was that Maria Braun wasn't rushing headlong into this romance with Sir Graham. It almost made her feel guilty about having ventured into the forest. Judging by Maria Braun's reactions to what she said of Spectre, though, she assumed it was safe to say they were both forgiven for bending their promises to their wills. Spectre never left the trees. They reached down and brushed the, her scarf off before playing with her hair, curling around the tree's trunk and branches for balance. But they never touched the ground. Lysada knew they followed her to the edge of the woods, listening as the branches bowed under Spectre's weight in their determination to follow her and protect her along her path home. She assumed that was their goal. In some way... Lysada knew she had grown to love Spectre in a short time. She was left slightly disappointed in herself over this realization, as she had been angry with her sister for becoming infatuated with Sir Graham so quickly at first. But Spectre hadn't asked her to change the way Sir Graham had requested Maria Braun change. She thought of how soft Maria Braun's hands must be growing as she was forbidden to work any, any longer. Meanwhile, Lysada's palms grew rougher and rougher. Spectre had made the transition easier. Perhaps that was why Lysada found herself fond of them in spite of never having seen them. She had heard them, however, even though they didn't speak often. They chuckled, and they answered in single words. Rarely did they say anything more than three words at once, yet every meeting felt meaningful to Lysada. Over time, she had gone from sharing all her frustrations and upsets with Spectre to sharing her joys and triumphs as well. She asked questions of Spectre, and sometimes Spectre ans answered. Deep down, she wished she could hear more of Spectre and know that what she loved was real and not just a transparent Spectre. The same invisible appendage draped around her shoulders, and she found herself smiling wide as she stared at the letter she had begun to compose to Maria Braun. She hummed, mentioning in the letter how she wished Maria Braun could meet Spectre and see how they had become the only one outside their family to make Lysada smile. She knew for more reasons than just one that the chances of that happening were very slim. Lysada, Drudwin, and Rigna started their day as they typically did. They went about everything as they usually did. Neither Drudwin nor Rigna questioned their daughter when after work and before dinner she went into the forest. They assumed she was meeting someone there. They assumed correctly. They did not worry for their daughter. Lysada had in the past proven 
wholly exempt from the charms she complained Maria Braun had received too much of. They assumed she was not falling for the charms of someone who intended to do her wrong. They assumed correctly. They had raised their daughters to be intelligent and savvy. They had taught them as much as they could offer them, and they had loved them equally, defending them even from each other. If one needed help, they assumed she would come running to them. They assumed correctly. There was a silence that preceded the scream. There was a terror that shook them to action. There was a burst of movement from the, tr from the woods where their daughter usually went to meet her unknown companion named Spectre. That burst was Lysada, fist closed around her knife and soaked in blood up to her sleeve. She had panic in her eyes, but determination in her step. They ran to her, carrying the tool of their trade as they rushed forth to help their daughter. They were feet from her when her assailant crashed out of the woods behind her. A Balexian sorcerer riding a worm. The sorcerer was clad in purple and gold robes, the royal guard a royal guard judging by the colors and circlets the man wore. Drudwin, Drudwin recognized the patterns from long ago. A worm neither had, ev neither had ever seen in person. A long-bodied, wingless cousin to the dragon. It moved on four limbs and had the muzzle, ears, and horns of a dragon. The long, symmetrical whiskers curled upward as it snarled. They lost sight of the sorcerer's face as the worm reared up and roared, revealing a bloody gash on its belly where Lysada had sliced. Its head angled downward towards Lysada as its paws struck out. Two digits careened against the side of Lysada's head, and to the ground she fell. Drudwin and Rigna cried out for their daughter, but the worm had already lifted her into its mouth, and the sorcerer was directing it back into the woods. The worm, easily twice the size of the average stallion, managed to slip into the trees unseen. All that was left were the tracks. The villagers who had watched rushed to organize. Drudwin ordered his wife to return home, as he was going to gather the most skilled hunters to pursue the beast who had stolen his remaining daughter. She left, but did not return home as the hunters of the village raced to Drudwin's shop in a mad dash for weapons. No, she mounted a friend's horse bareback, having only just pulled a bridle into place before racing down the snow-laden trail to the castle in Etmana, the castle Maria, where Maria Braun had been taken. They were dining when they were informed of a peasant woman frantically rushing to the castle. At first, they thought nothing of it. Then Maria Braun recognized the description of her mother's hair, and there wasn't a servant or noble in the castle who could tell her to stand back as others went to investigate. When she re reached her mother out in the courtyard, she forgot all she had been told of proper greeting practices. She ignored their difference in clothing entirely refusing to consider how throwing her arms around her mother's shoulders would sully her expensive gown and cloak. Her mother had raised her in a garden. She would no sooner turn her away if she were drenched in mud. Their foreheads pressed together the moment they released each other from the embrace. Sir Graham stood at Maria Braun's back, the knights who had escorted Rigna in surrounding them. One held the sweating horse she had ridden in on, the poor creature tired from her race to the castle. At last, Maria Braun asked, What are you doing here, mother? Rigna seemed to want to smile at how properly her daughter spoke. It was clear she wanted to praise her, but the tears in her eyes denoted grave news. It's Lysada. Her mother's lips pursed as she withheld a wave of tears and cries. She's been taken... Maria Braun froze for a moment, but then her face began to pull in an expression that mirrored her mother's. Her distress was evident enough that Sir Graham stepped in to speak instead of allowing Maria Braun to respond on her own. Who took her? He asked, his palms resting on Maria Braun's shoulders in a gesture of affection unsuited for royalty, but welcomed by the standards of the lower class. 
A Pelexian, said Regna. Maria Braun reached up to cover her mouth with both hands. Drudwin is taking the villagers to find her, but I don't know if they'll come back. Maria Braun left Sir Graham's hands, and the women embraced once more. And Sir Graham had never felt such an obvious stab in his heart, seeing these two rail over their missing daughter and sister. It was a familiar bewailing to him. He still recalled how he had hurt over Petra's disappearance. His fierce, fearless younger sister, the princess who had convinced dragons to help them drive back Belexis. Belexis was breaching their treaty now, just in taking Maria Braun's sister. Belexis. That kingdom had taken enough from Atmana. They would not take from them a simple villager, not without a fight. Gather a small troop, Sir Graham ordered the knights. Inform His Majesty King Locke. His double, rather, who would then inform Kinlock himself. I will be addressing a breach. If Belexis didn't release Lysada, then he would see to it the offending Belexians were punished harshly. Maria Braun and Rigna looked at him with looks he had never seen before. He had never read such expressions. Was it shock? Was it respect? He was unsure. But he knew that this was something he needed to do, and he told them why. Were it any other member of our kingdom, I would address it with the same urgency. He finished his explanation quietly, meant only for Maria Braun and her mother to hear. Taking Maria Braun's left hand in his, he addressed her. However, this is a matter particularly close to my own heart. There was a silence that passed between them. The knights parted, carrying out his orders. Rigna looked on at her daughter, who stared meaningfully at the prince, at Sir Graham. The hush lasted for but a moment, and was only interrupted by Maria Braun stepping towards Sir Graham. Her fingers brushed his jaw as she stood on her toes to let her lips rest against his. Sir Graham closed his eyes, pressing back into the kiss while letting his arm circle her waist to bring her closer. His palms splayed over her lower back as his other hand gripped her shoulder gently, her own hands drifting to the base of his neck to rest. Their mouths moved in time for a brief interlude, and then they parted. His cheeks red from such a scandalous display of affection, he proceeded to make good on his declaration to secure Atmana's treaty with Belexis and find his love sister. Drudwin had been reluctant to wait for Rigna to return from where it was she had gone to, but his gut had told him to be patient. Rigna was a sensible woman. She did not depart in harsh times unless there was good reason. He found himself venturing into the forest the day after she departed, the day after he had gathered a hunting party. They too wondered why he waited, why he lingered when the trail may fade, but it was cold, and the snow had not dissipated in any way. The tracks remained, and he could afford to wait just for today, for his wife to return to him. The forest was quiet. It was almost like there was something else lurking behind the trees, waiting. It had been nearing dark when he, real when he first realized Rigna had fled the village. It had taken all of his strength not to press every villager for knowledge on where she had been heading, he could probably guess, in which case he could wait. He could wait for her to return, and then he would go forth and find their lost daughter. He trusted Rigna. She was going to get help, and so he would wait. He was standing a few feet into the tree line when he heard the thud of something dropping to the ground, accompanied by the rapid fall of snow shaken from the limbs of trees. Drudwin stiffened, glancing about, anticipating seeing an animal or some other creature lying on the ground. He saw nothing. Had he imagined the sound? He couldn't have. Was he so distracted with worry that he had begun hallucinating? Something shifted out of the corner of his eye, and it drove him to pull his warhammer from its sheath. Holding it in both hands, he turned toward the movement. Nothing. 
There was nothing there. Only there was. The creature revealed itself by way of snow lining its otherwise perfectly camouflaged body. So well camouflaged, he saw no features whatsoever. There was only the snow lining a long, invisible body which did not walk, but instead slithered towards him. There were handprints in the snow as it drew nearer, as though it pulled its long, serpentine body towards him. An invisible naga? A, m a worm with not four but two legs and beyond normal cloaking abilities? Whatever it was, he was raising his hammer in defense. The creature stilled, and for a moment he thought he was going to scare it off. But then, something whipped around the staff of his hammer, just wrapping around the space between his hands, and shocking him enough to yank the weapon from him and toss it across the forest floor. Once his eyes had left the creature, the invisible specter, he could not find it again. A breath fell across his cheek. He stilled, heart pounding, palms sweating. A soft voice murmured, I am here to help. Frozen. Drudwin stood frozen as the air from the creature's mouth stopped blowing across his face. He stood, he stood stock still, a previous thought occurring to him yet again. An invisible specter. Drudwin and Rigna had never been introduced to this person who had befriended their Lysada. You are Spectre. A hum in response, and Drudwin did not relax entirely, but he did lose some of that ice that had seeped into his blood. He had to ask before he be bellowed at the creature for not doing something about Lysada's disappearance sooner, before he accused it of standing aside and letting her be taken. Do you know where to find her? Another hum. He presumed that to be Spectre's positive reaction. Lead me to her, he demanded. First, something flicked snow off the tree to his side. Your help. Ah, yes. He could go get his men. But then, how will we find you again? There was no hesitation. Inspector's next move. A set of marks were scraped into the very same tree that had been relieved of snow. some snow. Claw marks. They appeared as if by magic, from out of nothingness, just like Spectre. Upon seeing that, he knew he would find his daughter's friend and help her again. Drudwin! A voice called from Darga. He turned away, going to meet one of the hunters who had volunteered to help him. He entered the village to find not just the hunters prepared to track down the Balexian sorcerer, but a band of soldiers as well. Soldiers led by Sir Graham. Rigna. She would always go the extra mile for him and their family. She had been going to see Spectre. Then she had been cut off and pursued by the sorcerer and his mount. Then she had been knocked out. And when she awoke, she knew, intrinsically, she was far from home. Lysada sat up, aching from her lost fight with the worm and Balexian. Her dress was torn, her scarf was gone, her hair was matted and she had been lying in mud. She glanced around. It was dark, the sound of water dripping on stone and into puddles, complementing the scent of wetness and dirt. She coughed on another scent, one she unfortunately recognized to be human waste. She had to struggle not to be too disgusted by the thought to get up and see who those figures lining the wall were. There were burning sconces lining the walls intermittently. It was uneven. Clearly, whoever held them captive did not care about providing that much light, and there seemed to be a lot of them. Lysada approached cautiously, only to be stopped. She almost fell down, her ankle tethered to the ground by something that was neither chain nor rope. She kicked at it. There was nothing. Nothing but an anklet she had not noticed upon getting up. What she did notice was that her dagger had been taken from her. She let out a loud curse just as someone asked, What kingdom? 
She looked up, glancing about for the person who, she, who had asked. It was so difficult to see the people who lined the walls. They almost blended in with the mud. How long had they been down here to have gotten so dirty? At Mana, she answered honestly. She then asked, How many are you? Fourteen, now that you are here, answered the same voice. Your skin is pale. We knew you could not be Belexian. Lysada's brow furrowed. Are you all Belexian? A collective positive response. For some reason, being imprisoned with the same people who had imprisoned her made her heart start beating faster, and her stomach twist. What are you here for? And the same voice answered just as honestly, speaking against Her Majesty Fael. Before she could ask, she was then greeted by another voice. Many came before us. All died. How did you speak out? she asked, somewhat mortified at the implication they were in the Queen's own dungeon. She was then barraged by explanation. All at once, the voices seemed to speak from all directions, rising and falling in varying pitches and tones. It was haunting, as if the walls themselves were speaking to her. I told her I would no longer fight for her. Her war had cost us our families. We were tired of fighting. The dragons she wanted dead. They took from us a number of our own people. She wouldn't stop hunting them even after the war against your kingdom was lost. Fighting them was more devastating. They didn't care how many they crushed, only that they lived. She never struck out against Atmana after the war, only the dragons. She even tortured the very last one she caught. His scales and bones lay behind you. At that, Lysada turned. Their voices all rang in her mind as she stared down at the lumps of bone and scale. The remains of something mighty, something she had longed to see since childhood. She now saw it, pieces of it, and in her head echoed the words of the old sorcerers imprisoned with her, the old warriors. Some were old. Some sounded only a few years older than she. She felt ill, ill at the thought of what had happened, at what they were describing. Her throat threatened to close. She didn't stop until she took our princess, too, she added. They did not respond. Still, her eyes lingered on the dragon's remains, rib bones that dwarfed her, scales that made her seem small. She felt so small. Dropping to her knees, she stared. She couldn't think of anything else to do aside from stare, mourn. You must be special, one declared. She sounded like an older woman, a woman who was once strong. You would not have been brought to this dungeon if you weren't. There are others like this? She asked in disbelief. Few, a younger man answered. So many of us stopped fighting, if only she would not continue to punish us. She would not listen to her own people. But she is one person. Royalty only has power because you give it, Lysada declared. His Majesty Kinlock did not rule by fist. If he did, everyone would fear him more. She would hate him and his brother more for taking Maria Braun. Would this have happened if Maria Braun hadn't been taken? Can't you all stand up to her? Her forces, her magic, they are too strong. But there are so many of you. It didn't make sense to her. If all of you don't want to fight, then why not fight her? You are not Belexian. You do not understand. She turned to them, away from the bones and scale, scales which had perplexed her. She pinned a stare on one of them. Try to explain to me. They bristled. Perhaps she shouldn't be quite so crass. 
These were not her family, after all. They were not of her village, and used to her brazen ways. Please. There was hesitation. They were unsure. Was it because she was not Belexian, or was it because they were scared of repercussion? She was unsure. Either way, the younger man from before told her, The ruler of Belexus is granted a gift. What gift? she asked. The gift of negation. There was a smack. She could just barely see the dim light that someone had struck the young man for speaking so plainly. Negation? she dared to ask. You are not one of us, an older man hissed. You cannot know. I'm trapped down here like you, she argued. What have you got to lose? Another round of silence. The young man rubbed his stricken head. He looked at the one who had hit him and waited for them to scoot away before he continued. Anyone within a few feet of her loses the ability to wield their sorcery. For a moment she wondered why that would make such a huge difference. Then it struck her why. Belexus was a land of sorcerers. What use did they have with physical combat if they had magic? Then again, do any of you know how to fight? There was no answer. For some reason that astonished her. After an indeterminable amount of quiet, she got a response. Why do you think the dragons were such an effective weapon against us? She did know that answer. Because their scales are magic-resistant. Some dragons were magically inclined themselves. They were large fighters, both physically and magically. They could swallow a sorcerer and a warrior alike with ease. Sorcerers didn't know how to fight. Not hand to hand. And the queen could negate their magic at will? Are you negated now? She is not in here with us. Then why do you stay, or is everything here enchanted? The lack of answer told her enough. Lysada stood again. She glimpsed from the thirteen other prisoners back to the dragon scales and bones. She pondered. The twist in her stomach was gone now, but something else settled there, like a knot. She had been captured. Why? She wasn't sure. Perhaps she had grown too trusting of the forest, and its safety thanks to Spectre. She really didn't know. But she did know that she was not going to sit in here in her own waist until someone found her. And suddenly she knew something she was sure no other Atmanen knew. There had always been moments when her family had asked that she slowed down with her thought processes, that she think of the consequences. There were times where she had been so outspoken, even they had had to tell her she needed to take a rest. There were times where she had been downright bullheaded. There were times where she had gotten into fights. One thing she could say she had never lost, she had never lost a fight. Arguments were another story. She was not always good at winning arguments, too brash, too quiet, or too loud. There was never an in-between when she spoke, especially when in company of those she was comfortable with. But a fight? She couldn't seem to lose a fight, not unless she truly wanted to lose. The queen couldn't lose her to her own people because they were sorcerers, not warriors. That was fine. As the other prisoners said, she was no sorcerer. That was perfect. Moving towards the bones and scales, she lifted one scale up. She expected it to be hard and heavy. She expected it to be impossible to lift. Instead, it was light. Light and amazingly flexible. There were times her mind ran rampant with ideas, and this was one of those times. First it landed on a memory of a woman on horseback in the armor of a soldier. Then her mind scurried over to all of what she knew of dragon scale. She had never held it in her hands before. She had always had trouble with making armor, but this material made itself. Pressing it to her chest, it folded around her body. Something so flimsy, 
It had brought a kingdom to its knees, and here it sat unused. It seemed unlikely that an entire region didn't see this as a commodity. Do none of you have smiths? No answer. No smiths? Really? We have those who fashion knives and staves. Crafting is the only purpose those without magic have. But none of those crafters made armor. With no smiths for armor, they must not have needed it before or thought to have it. There must be an extreme few who even lack the magic that landed them in the crafting position. She picked up another scale, then looked at herself. She had no materials, no real forage with her. Any magic they possessed would surely be absorbed into the scale and bone. She reached down and pulled up the hem of her skirt. It was already torn. What was another tear? Another tear or several. She wore leggings underneath, and the cloth was needed elsewhere. She looked to the bones, tugging against her ankle as she began sifting through them. She almost cheered when she found what she was looking for. Claws and fangs. She could shape what she had with those. Lysada stopped for a moment to question herself. Was she really thinking of doing this? But then again, would she really ever just lie down and take imprisonment with no perceivable end in sight? Could you all break out if you wanted to? She asked. Surely someone in here had to know how to undo enchantments, and she was unsure of her success rate on her own. But she wasn't alone. She had thirteen sorcerers here who, in her opinion, deserved a say in their kingdom. Why would we? She glared, determined down at the pile of dragon scales and bones. Because we have the perfect armory against Balexians here, and I am just a blacksmith. This beast leading us, Sir Graham addressed Druidwin. It is a companion of yours? Of Lysada's. Spectre led them with the claw marks. The claw marks in the trees had led them away from the track po tracks at one point. Spectre explaining to Druidwin the tracks were misleading and were meant to confuse after a time so they could not find the true path. But Spectre knew the true path. It can be trusted? I trust my daughter. And Lysada had trusted Spectre. Lysada was no fool. Stubborn and salty, but no fool. They had crossed the border into Belexis that night. They did not run into trouble. They halted when the marks stopped appearing. They never saw the mysterious creature that led them. Not fully, at least. Bits and pieces. That was all they could pick up on. Bits and pieces was all they needed. They would pause, go quiet, listen. They would realize that Spectre had stopped them on purpose, so they would not be spotted prior to reaching their destination. I would say we should give the benefit of, of a doubt normally, Sir Graham told Drudwin. But there is someone at risk. Drudwin concurred. Sir Graham hummed. Someone very important was at risk. They could just see through the trees people moving at times. They could just hear conversation. Spectre helped them avoid it all. How often do you think this creature slips through unnoticed like this? Often enough, Druidwin responded quietly. Then again, not often since. He stopped. Sir Graham noticed, but said nothing at first. They let the quiet hang heavy between them for a small time. Then Sir Graham asked, since it met Lysada. Drudwin nodded. It seemed it was as easy to speak with this prince as his daughter had described. He wished he could have spoken to him more on different terms, learned just how elevated his mind was compared to theirs, or if he was level-headed. He hoped, perhaps, after this, he may get the chance to see if Maria Braun had, in fact, chosen well in spite of Lysada's concerns. They passed through, seemingly unnoticed. 
Upon reaching their destination, they had to pause momentarily to take in where it was Spectre had led them. Fael's palace, one soldier whispered. It seemed odd how similar the architecture seemed in spite of the difference of kingdoms. Bogdan had more varied architecture than Belexis, all curves and domes. Belexis looked oddly like Atmana, save for its people. It was strange, but stranger still were the lack of guards and the wide open front doors. And the stranger yet sounds from within the palace. It had taken them three days of to find this place, and now it took a mere moment for them to charge inside. Lysada was inside. Drudwin's daughter was inside. And before they were inside, Spectre had already disappeared in their own swift search. Bone swords fashioned out of ribs, scale plates tied over chests and legs. Lysada had assured them it was already all right to fight with their magic, because now they were prepared for when the queen entered their presence. Some opted out of carrying bone shields made from the spare parts of the dragon, said that it would be too heavy for them. Her only advice? Make sure to keep the scales over the torso and back to protect the organs. She had labored tirelessly, hiding her efforts when the guards brought them meager rations and scraps to eat. She hadn't stopped using all of her strength to dig and dig and grind at the bones. She had known dragon materials to be hard, and was utterly relieved that dragons were, in fact, weak to their own claws. The Thirteen had practiced to see if the remains of the dragon really did absorb all magical attack. It did. One young woman had accidentally caught Lysada's hair on fire in the practice. I'm sorry, Mom. Lysada had whispered as they had helped her cut her hair off to the shoulders. She told herself it would grow back, that her mother would forgive her. The anklet that had trapped her in one spot had been undone by the magic of an elder woman, who was also the one who managed to get the enchanted dungeon door to open. Once it was open, Lysada stayed in the back and they led the way. This was their home they were fighting for their freedom and kingdom. She was just a blacksmith who armed them. Her heart beat was so her heart beat so fast, and she wondered if theirs beat rapidly too. The very moment guards post posted realized what was happening, sparks flew. The old warriors let out cries, the likes of which she had never heard before, and the magic they combated with was both breathtaking and terrifying. The heat reminded her of the forge she hadn't had to make the weapons and armor, so she treated it like a forge. Her heart hammering and breathing labored, she held her bone shield overhead and protected herself from magical fire. She couldn't see much during the battle. She was too busy guarding herself against attack. The thirteen were able to stretch out in a line across the hallway, a wall of impenetrable dragon scale and magical fire. They absorbed the attacks of their captors, and returned fire without restraint. She wondered vaguely how they had mustered enough energy to fire so readily. She presumed that fighting for one's life made one do incredible things. Things grew louder as they pressed down unfamiliar corridors and descended to floors above. The higher they went, the more she wondered how unwise one had to be to keep prisoners under their own home. How self-assured they had to be. Guard after guard fell or ran from the ongoing attack. She couldn't believe how easy this seemed at first. How quickly she was able to accept death at face value. It would have to strike her later. She didn't have time to ponder. She started worrying about guards rushing from behind, mentioned it to the others. A section of the band wrapped around a face behind her. She couldn't help but appreciate that they didn't expect her to run headlong into magical fire. She may be equipped to arm them, but was she equipped to wield her own weapons? The answer was yes, but only on a ma non-magical front. And suddenly, they had reached that front. 
She saw the panic within the thirteen warriors for a moment, the horror as their magic suddenly ceased to conjure. She lowered her shield just enough to peer past them. They were at the entrance of a grand hall. At the entrance stood a woman in the most regal robes and gown Lysada had ever beheld, the colors, the materials, the scorn on her face. This is your attempt at a rebellion? The woman raised her hand in a casting position. Lysada had seen the, other's prisoner, the other prisoners use. They were scared. She could tell. They held their weapons with uncertainty. They did not want to die. She did not want to die. Pushing past them as Her Majesty Fael unleashed a spell that made her hair stand on end, Lysada held her makeshift shield in front of her. If she proved to them they could survive with the armor she had given them, perhaps they would feel reinvigorated. Her arm felt like it had nearly broken under the pressure of the sorcerer's blast. She had bent forward just in time to absorb the shock, but said shock was still enough to make her stumble once the pressure was off. Much to her relief, she came out otherwise unscathed. The part of her leggings and shoes, which had been vulnerable to the blast, were hot and somewhat burnt, but everywhere her shield and armor had covered remained hot and undamaged. Hot, but undamaged. Fael's grimace intensified. The fourteen charged in, just as the remaining guard appeared and retaliated from behind the queen. Drudwin, Graham, and their band moved fast, but the creature called Spectre moved faster. They slid up familiar steps, rolling over and wrapping around corridors they remembered from years ago, they followed the sound of Balexian battle cries and found them in a great hall. The great hall. The great hall where their life had officially come to an end. The battle currently Balexian on Balexian, they searched for the singular face they deemed most important, the one they had come to save. As fear coiled within them, adrenaline took hold and they shot forward towards the woman whom they had befriended, Lysada. Their Lysada was armored and fighting. They did not recognize the crude weapons the Balexian rebels, they assumed them to be rebels, wielded until they glimpsed the scale of their armor. Literal scales. They had never seen such a thing on a Balexian, but it was working. The dragon scale was working. And the soldiers and hunters were coming. Soon the queen and her remaining men would be overwhelmed. Slithering back to warn Drudwin of the rebellion, suddenly Spectre heard a distressed voice and froze. They knew that voice. They knew that distress. She was struggling. Lysada was struggling. Spectre whirled about and in all of their invisible monstrosity shot forth towards the guards who were fighting her. Lysada's bone weapon had been knocked from her hand, but she was holding them off with her shield, albeit barely. They were pushing her toward a flight of stairs, her companions in arms too entrenched to notice. Lysada tried swinging her shield, but it did nothing but drive her further back, closer to the edge. Spectre's heart pounded in their chest. They slithered through the struggle with ease, unseen and unheard in spite of the length of their body. They reached Lysada as she was about to fall, and without hesitation they coiled fully and completely around Lysada's body and shield. A dagger pierced Spectre's side just before they fell. At last, at least, Lysada was protected from the fall. The calamity on the floor above was drowned out the moment she landed on a platform at the bottom of the stairs. She had expected that to hurt much more, the hard steps never quite reaching her to break her bones or otherwise injure her. She landed as though on a cushion, and as said cushion unraveled from her, she recognized its hum. Spectre? she cried out, momentarily forgetting where she was and what she had been doing and dropping her shield. She completely forgot about it when she saw a black substance lining the steps and pooling out over a body she had otherwise never seen. Spectre! she cried again, 
reaching for them, though she could not see them clearly. She had never seen them clearly. She felt, but did not see, a palm against her cheek, cold and clammy. Using the sensation to map out the other's translucent frame, she traced along their arm until she found a torso to latch onto. She pulled Spectre against her, lifting them into her embrace. Her friend. This was the first time she had ever held her friend. Lysada closed her eyes and squeezed Spectre cautiously, careful to avoid their presumed injury. She felt and heard something drag across the floor, circling them and wrapping around them as if to return the embrace. She clung to Spectre, imagining what they looked like for what must have been the thousandth time. She felt shallow breaths against her neck. She felt chilled skin. She rubbed Spectre's arm while her eyes were closed. No hair. The tips of Spectre's fingers were sharp. Their true appearance remained for the most part unfathomable to her. But she didn't care. To, she didn't care to imagine any longer when the f for the most part quiet creature murmured a disembodied Lissy. Lysada choked, again squeezing her friend tight. You came here to save me. A quiet hum, Spectre's familiar hum. I'm, I'm so sorry. She actually felt tears prick her eyes as they opened and gazed down at the wound that proved Spectre was there, that proved Spectre had saved her. Something, a fingertip most likely, brushed the tears that were forming from her eyes. In that moment, Lysada tried to imagine what a world without Spectre would be like. If she lost Spectre, her friend, the creature she had called just her friend, her heart clenched, her throat was tight, her innards twisted and she let out a gasp of someone in utter agony. She didn't want a world without Spectre. But Spectre was already cold, and the others were still fighting. She could not foresee them receiving the help Spectre would need. Don't cry, the creature asked, but it was too late. She had realized too late. She didn't care if she never truly saw them, or heard a full sentence from them, or knew them any better than she knew them now. Spectre was real to her, real and everything she feared to lose. A friend who had come to her in her times of need, comforted her, saved her. Too late. Lysada would lose the one she knew she loved also. Maria was right, she replied brokenly. Another brush at her eyes, and an upset moan Eyes closed, and holding Spectre tight, she refrained from weeping a moment longer to run her fingers over a face she couldn't see. When her thumb brushed the space where Spectre exhaled, she kissed them. Spectre went still, the gesture brief and tender. I love you, she whispered to them too late. She clung to them after like she was, she was too late. Spectre gave her a start when lips brushed against hers again, but she returned the kiss anyhow. If Spectre wanted her kiss before they perished, she would give them. That was the very least she, w she wanted to give. She wished she could have given so much more. Spectre's palm lay against her cheek once more as their mouths moved, moved slowly, learning their patterns and pressure and curves and dips. Lysada's palm slid hesitantly to a more comfortable position to hold Spectre, and the coil around them that was allegedly Spectre's tail loosened. Lysada grew heady, heady from the kiss, heady enough not to notice the warmth spreading through Spectre's body, the change in her shape, the change in her visibility. It wasn't until hair fell across Lysada's arms she opened her eyes and she managed to keep from jolting, barely. The creature, no, 
The person in her arms was not the specter she had imagined. Dark eyes sat like pools of earth in a fair face. Hair, long and honey-colored, fell to their waist. It dragged over the ground the way Lysana's hair once did, the way Maria Braun's hair surely did still. The person was much smaller than she imagined Spectre, much more beautiful, and with familiar features she couldn't yet place. The woman, uninjured and still tracing Lysada's own features with her clawless fingertips, rested naturally in Lysada's arms, as if she belonged there, as if she were home. Her first act? Running her fingers through Lysada's hair, as Spectre had done so many times before, and whispering in a voice no longer disembodied but most assuredly Spectre's, I like your hair like this. The shock dissipated instantaneously upon Lysada's third and most fervid kiss to her beloved's lips. Lysada was relinquished by the victorious Balexian warriors, the thirteen going to stand before cheering and a cheering and relieved kingdom. Before leaving, she learned their names so she could go back and tell of how they had reclaimed Balexis for a newer and brighter future featuring less warfare. Those who supported the queen were banished. The queen was no longer their ruler. When Lysada escorted her no longer injured companion back to the band, they were quick to offer the nude woman robes. As soon as she stood face to face with Sir Graham, the resemblance was clear as was the reason of li for Lysada's capture. Petra the Dragon Tamer had been such an influential part of the war that Fael had sought not to kill her but to curse her. She gave the princess a form so hideous that she would beg to never be seen again. Fael granted her wish, and Petra had been turned loose in the, into the wild. She was to remain friendless and loveless until her dying days or so the queen had believed. When it was revealed that she had indeed not remained friendless, Fael stole away the one person who had never even tried to see Petra and keep her company. In the end, the curse broke under the weight of Lysada's and Petra's love for one another. Petra and Graham embraced the same tearful and disbelieving way Maria Braun and Lysada embraced upon seeing one another again. Their families reunited and the princess returned to Atmana. There remained no doubt in their minds with whom the Dargan sisters would choose to spend their lives. But there was a question. Would you return to us? Thera, one of the thirteen war warriors, asked Lysada. You could teach us much. We could defend ourselves better and forge an alliance, Bayan, another warrior, had declared. Petra had hesitated, and rightfully so. It was Lysada who had convinced her. This is a chance to mend what's been broken. Petra and Graham shared uncertain expressions, turning to Lysada with, the same with those same concerned looks, only for her to counter. They made a difference in the success of your mission to rescue me. I, at the very least, would like to return the favor by showing them what my father taught me. She could introduce to a kingdom that knew nothing of armor and weaponry a chance to broaden their horizons and feel less isolated than they had been previously. But even Druidwind reminded her, you still have much to learn. For a moment, she was disheartened. The man who had embraced her upon seeing her again was right. She was still a smithing apprentice. Drudwin clapped a hand on her shoulder, however, and squeezed. Take over my shop at home and perhaps we can set up a trade. She looked up at her father in disbelief, then flung her arms around him. Drudwin traveled to a small part of Balexis through the woods daily, teaching them how to make and dress to fight. Lysada stayed in Darga, and there, Balexians came to learn weaponry. Maria Braun became wife to Sir Graham, Prince of Atmana. Lady Petra, Princess of Atmana, 
decided to return to their palace only to prove that she was alive. Her home? By Lysada's side. And Lysada had a duty in helping to build the alliance between the neighboring, once feuding kingdoms. His Majesty Kinlock granted his sister the peace she so desired without question. So long as both women graced them with their presence once in a while. Villagers of Darga had been less warm in reception to the Belexians than Belexus had been to Drudwen, but Petra's presence kept their rumors and concerns in check. Petra often caught Lysada staring into the forest, down the road that had been carved for her father and traveling Belexians. Petra had never quite been as soft as princesses should be, she had told Lysada. It was her roughness that had won her the alliance with the, of the dragons. She too stared into the wood, but more to mourn what friends she had lost over the years. Petra draped her arms over the shoulders of the blacksmith's daughter, the blacksmith she had settled at home for. She thought of her own grief and asked, Do you miss the time spent out there? It was strange, wondering if it would have been better if she had continued sitting in trees and watching Lysada from a measured distance. Lysada ran a rough hand over Petra's arm. I like what I have here. The princess smiled. Then what are you searching for when you look out there? Lysada shook her head. I'm not searching, just thinking of what I found there. The smile widened. And what did you find? Something beautiful. Petra leaned in to kiss Lysada, her hands moving to thread her fingers through her still short locks of red hair. She could never get used to the affection. It would always be both too much and not enough for her. Between breathy kisses, Petra whispered, I'm the one who found the treasure. A treasure beyond compare. Thank you for listening to The Dargan Sisters, a short story in story time with Rowan Little. If you enjoyed it, please consider purchasing the ebook version on my Gumroad or buying me a coffee. The next read aloud will be the prologue of my high fantasy novel, The Blood of the Enemy, The White Dragon Saga. If, mayhap, you are interested in learning new things with me, or just want to see cute animals and get free read alouds of my stories, please like and subscribe. If you have anything interesting on your radar, don't hesitate to share. I can't wait to hear about it, and I will catch you on the flip.